Shall we, Emily? Yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started and others will, will join us over the next few minutes. Over to you, Carlos, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Raul Mercer, uh, who is our speaker in this, in this seminar today. Um, uh, Raul Mercer is a pediatrician from Argentina. Uh, with, he has a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Madison in Wisconsin. Um, he currently coordinates the social sciences and health program at Plaxo, that is the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences, uh, which he will describe in greater detail during his seminar. Uh, he has worked in the management of uh, programs at the Ministry of Health in the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, Buenos Aires is a very federal, uh, Argentina is a very federalized health system, and as well at the Ministry of, of National Health. Uh, his fields of expertise are children's health, women's health, rights, gender, and life course. As I have told, uh, especially the students in for Latin America, the rights approach is an extremely valuable uh, consideration. From Flexo, he develops uh, teaching activities in the field of health promotion, sexuality education, human development. His areas of interest are related to the social determinants on health, and more recently, to the commercial determinants of childhood and adolescent health. He represented the region of the Americas in the 2012 WHO sponsored Helsinki workshop of, on health in all policies, addressing the intersectorial work in public health. And he continued working on children's health in all policies, giving him the leadership, a real a leadership role as commissioner of the Lancet uh, WHO UNICEF Commission on a future for the world's uh, children, a topic to which he will refer during his presentation. He's a member of the International Society of Social Pediatrics, a global space for debate, advocacy, and knowledge generation around child, childhood and emerging issues related with children. Globally, as I have said to, to my students as well, uh, the social dimension of health is, is really ingrained in all the public health in Latin America. Uh, I have known Raul for many years, um, but I started uh, mainly when I worked at PAHO as head of health promotion and NCDs. Uh, and now life brings us together again on the work to protect children from the commercial determinants of health, uh, connected to my work on regulatory uh, institutional capacity uh, in developing countries. This has been evolving over the past few months and on February 14th of this year, I am pleased to, to tell all of you that GW and Flaxo signed a memorandum of understanding uh, that you all should take advantage of. Uh, it's for collaboration, uh, for projects, for exchanges of students, faculty, uh, internships, and research. So it's an open uh, general uh, memorandum of understanding that we can all use. Uh, today, uh, we have our first formal activity under the memorandum of understanding with this joint seminar between the Center for Commercial Determinants of Health, the Latin American Faculty of Social Sciences in, in Argentina, and our Department of Global Health. Uh, now I ask uh, Dr. Raul Mercer to take over, uh, and for all the audience, uh, if you want to intervene, uh, you can always send uh, a comment in the chat, or at the end we will have uh, questions and answers. So, uh, Raul, in your hands. Thank you, Carlos, Jim, for the invitation and for having the opportunity to participate today in this important webinar, uh, the starting point for our agreement. As uh, Carlos has mentioned, has mentioned before, we know each other uh, for, for many years. And if I, I have to rename the title of this presentation, I would call it uh, Life Brings Us Together, the three last years of my life. <laughs> so, I, and I think that you should understand and uh, 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 know about this uh, life history and the reason why we are now together, fortunately, uh, trying to. Uh, to create the infrastructure and the institutional agreements for future collaboration. A few words about Flaxo. Uh, Flaxo 
eh, is the Facultad Latinoamericana de Ciencias Sociales. Uh, you can see here all the member states of the Latin American region. And Flaxo has hit uh, its headworker, headquarters in, in Costa Rica. And it's uh, implemented or uh, is spread all over 14 countries in the region. And as you can see, where you can see the arrow, you are here. It means that we all are here in the very south of the Southern Corn. I'm based in Buenos Aires City. And Flaxo has its own programs and, and universities spread in different regions. Flaxo has been created in the 70s during the, the dictatorships in, in Latin America. And it was a kind of response to create the bank, intellectual bunker for those people who couldn't be exiled and they have to, to stay in their home countries and to, to prevent the consequence of the, uh, the dictatorship, um, the uh, authoritarian power of the military forces. And it was uh, at the first time an agreement between UNESCO and UN agency and the uh, foreign affairs of the ministries of the, each uh, at the country level. So in some way, Flaxo behaves as a UN agency system and in some way, those units are protected as are protected the embassies uh, at, the different, uh, at the different country levels. So uh, it works as a network. Uh, each country each has, has its own identity in terms of the programs that, or, as you can imagine, originally were based on social sciences, education, economy, sociology, uh, anthropology, and in our case, in Argentina, the possibility of creating an, a department or a program on, on health was something unusual. So in some way, I, I was an alien there, not in New York, in this case in Buenos Aires, where we started to develop this, this program uh, as a way to approach health, not from the traditional epidemi epidemi epidemiological or economical or a hard a public health perspective, but also from the social perspective, introducing social determinants as a key issue and rights as a key issue, but not rights as a, as a, as a declaration, as a rhetoric issue or theoretical. The, the point is how to bring rights to real life. And if you remember, Carlos in the introduction said that rights are very important for Latin America. And the reason to respond or to explain is very easy. We, as a region, we learn rights after violating systematically as a consequence of dictatorship and authoritarian uh, cues and governments. So we, as a region, we are starting to learn what does it mean to live in a rights-based environment, to live in democracy. I know how, how long does it take to uh, uh, the pregnancy in the human beings, but I have no response to know how long it's going to take to live in a true, genuine, participatory democracy. So I don't have the answer. And this is part of our uh, challenge as, as citizens. Um, and you can access to our website and I will be glad and happy to provide any kind of information regarding our organization. So we have, you have 14 reasons why to, to, to come to Flaxo and to have an agreement and to see this as a very healthy uh, horizon to work together. Uh, I'm talking about our presentation. The idea is to go through the highlights of the Lancet WHO UNICEF report. Then we are gonna talk about CAP 2030 as a strategic follow-up initiative. So uh, CAP means children in all policies. And just to tell you the truth, the reason why I had the opportunity to work in the health in all policies uh, environment was uh, as a consequence of the invitation of Carlos, was a generous uh, attitude from him to invite me to participate not only in the Congress of Health Promotion in, in Finland, but also to be part of a publication of a book on health in all policy. So I want to thank you in public, uh, Carlos, for your generosity. And this initiative, the COP2030, is a sort of strategic follow-up of the Lancet report. And finally, we are going to the, to the core issue of our presentation that has to do with 
approaches to commercial determinants of, of health, but with focus on children's health, considering that I am personally interested uh, in the harmful consequences of these determinants. And I invite you uh, to ask your questions, to debate, and I would say, in case you don't agree with my position and my perspective, just let this debate, because many of the things I'm gonna do are a result of personal uh, positions that not always are in agreement with the audience. So I invite you to, to confront, a, I would say, a healthy confrontation and to debate and to bring the different truths because I'm not the owner of the truth. So let's go to share a short story. On February the 3rd in 2020, we had a meeting with the United Nations Committee of the Rights of the Child based in Geneva. It was a Zoom conversation. And it was, I was in charge of making a presentation to the committee on the importance of bringing the commercial determinants of health uh, from the reg regulating point of view. And briefly, uh, in that meeting, there were representatives of WHO from UNICEF New York. The result was a mess. I mean, I would say that more than half of the people in the committee, they considered that it was a and not an important issue, it was too narrow using their words. So we fail in terms of involving the people that are supposed to defend and promote and fulfill the rights of the children, but it was just the beginning. But it, this is part of the story. A couple of day, days later, on February the 19th, we presented the report after two years of work with more than 45 professionals from all over the world, with face-to-face -face meeting in, in Senegal, in Dakar, in Lebanon, in Beirut. So th this was the result of a very cooperative, uh, collaborative, and I would say participatory process in order to reposition children in the SDGs, the, uh, the Sustainable Developmental Goals. But what we didn't take into account that on the same day, a virus was started to circulate in the environment and not only in WHO, in the whole planet. So we failed also from the strategic point of view to launch our uh, report the same day that the, this pandemic started. And as you know, as public health practitioners, anything that is beyond COVID does not exist in the reality. So this was really a mess, I mean, just a, a, a failure for us for not considering this, but besides that situation, we continue working in this process, trying to overcome the particular situation that we have to deal with in, in that particular moment. This process of writing this report was, has leadership. I'm talking about political leadership uh, representing these two women. One is Helen Clark, the former prime minister of New Zealand, and now the director of the uh, Partnership for Maternal and Neonatal and Child Health that in, uh, includes more than 100 organizations from all over the world, and Agua Colsec, the former Ministry of Health and Ministry of the State of Senegal. And this is important to take into account that we understand that political leadership is a key issue to take care and to manage and to sustain and to provide political power to this kind of uh, initiatives. In this uh, report, we highlighted that our uh, children are at risk today like never before. And in this sense, we include two main uh, threatens. One, they are related with the environmental threatens based on the so-called uh, climate uh, crisis. It's not anymore climate change, it's a crisis and the commercial threats that are based on the uh, targeting, uh, the marketing strategies of harmful substances and also harmful marketing strategies against children. So, as I mentioned before, the situation of a huge proportion of people all over the world uh, is bad, considering that they're in poverty, that they're affected by political fragility, so you can see their newspapers today, and we are in a world within conflicts, problems that are increasingly linked 
with the climate change and the de deterioration of the earth. And of course, the children are not part of this business. They are not taken into account. They don't appear in, in the declarations, in the policies. So part of our effort is re to reposition children within the SDGs. So look, the question is why now? Well, there are many justifications coming from science in terms of the bad consequences that is affecting that are affecting our planet. Just to let you know, Argentina, we are in a terrible situation if you're considering that one of the, our main rivers is practically dropped, the Paraná River, and parts of our country are under fire. The, we had fires in the Patagonia and nowadays in the Corrientes province where almost 10% 10, 10 of the province has been devastated, our forest, by these fires. So this is just an example that we are witnessing today. And as you know, as a public health practitioner, all these situations, they affect the health of the people, particularly those, the health of the poor and the health of the children and their mothers. And from the commercial marketing point of view, we know that the practices of commercial marketing is sometimes harmful uh, in terms of the characteristic of the product, but the marketing strategy, uh, strategies themselves. We know from information from Australia that in one year, almost uh, the children or the people in general were exposed to 51 million of advertisements of uh, products that are uh, unhealthy. Or a big study that has been done in countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, uh, children under between five and six years, almost 70% of children, they can recognize the brands of cigarettes at, at the, their age. So it seems that there are things happening every day that we are not conscious, but they are, they're happening every day based on the, uh, the harmful practices of these companies. Another thing that we know is that the industry has no self-regulation capacity they don't behave according, I would say, ethical or moral codes. I mean, the main role that is orienting their practices is profit. So any action that, that allows them to get profit is gonna be good. So there's no way uh, to let them to regulate the, the, their behaviors alone. So we need a special, I would say, I wouldn't say force, but any kind of action that comes from the state in terms of regulating uh, their activities. You can see in this slide that there are some countries that are assuming a position in terms of having a strong regulating, regulating capacity. One is Mexico, the other one in this region is Chile, but these are just examples. There, this is, doesn't represent at all the majority of the of the countries, and as you can imagine, the the policies of regulation in the global south are much weak, weak than what happens in European countries. And I know, and I think that is going to be part of the discussion that Carlos is particularly interested in the issues of regulation, considering that that's the key point of action that we have to take it into account. So. We know that to modify these conflicting scenarios and these challenges, we need a unified multi-sectoral action that I note also that you, as part of your training process, you are concerned about uh, multi-sectoral or intersectoral action. But we also know that there is no uh, scholastic way or formal education process to understand what means intersectoral action. You have to live and to deal with intersectorality working with the different actors, negotiating with them, bringing to the table, and also uh, trying to let people to understand what's the contribution in each sector to, to, the, to the whole. We are talking about health in this case. So I'm, as a doctor, as a medical doctor, I'm conscious that the health as a value cannot be restricted to the medical sector. So there is a huge evidence on the need to build a health as a collaborative way, as, a, as an intersectoral uh, manner, involving all the actors and stakeholders in the society. We also know that climate change needs to be approached. Unfortunately, we have, uh, I would say, this is my personal view, the sense that 
this agenda has been captured by youth people. So although I'm an advanced adolescent, I know that this is not my agenda. I agree with this agenda, I can support it, but this agenda has been captured and is managed by the young youth movement uh, around the world. And for, for me as a citizen, it's something that provides me a, a sort of a security that this is something that, be, that will be kept uh, for the coming future considering that the force and the strength of youth uh, cannot be stopped. We have examples of things that are happening here in Argentina with the sexual and reproductive movement, the so-called the green wave, that there are uh, almost adolescent girls that are fighting to defend their rights in terms of sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, and we have fortunately legalized abortion as a result of these uh, activism. And the other topic that I mentioned before, commercial determinants uh, of health, uh, they, have, they, are, they have to do with the, uh, the importance of bringing the, Comer, the Convention of the Rights of the Child into something that is uh, alive. I mean, just to transform the text of the convention into a potent uh, intervention strategy that can come uh, change the reality of millions and millions of children around the world. And you can see in this slide, some examples of harmful products uh, like tobacco, alcohol, formula milk, sugar sweetened beverages, but also gambling that starts at early stages of life and other issues related with uh, the commercial determinants. So now let's move to the second part of the presentation. As we know, after uh, I lost my presentation. Are you still there? Yes. Can you see the slide? Uh, I no, can, we can't. We can see you, but not the slide. OK, so let's pray. You have to share it again. OK. Is it there? It is there now. So, so. I'm agnostic, but this is a miracle. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the second part of the presentation. And as it happens with many of the reports, not only from the Lancet, but also from other kinds of reports from the academia or uh, UN agencies, the report is published and then sometimes is read and sometimes is used, but mostly they kept in a in a sh in the shelf, and no one reads it. So for this particular case, there was a transition from the report to the creation of an initiative that's called CAP 2030, 2030, according to the SDGs. And this strategy is based on how to take into account the recommendations of the Lancet report that has been published in six languages and that is available for all of you. And it has a communication strategy. You can access to all the information available that on, of ongoing activities. I will not spend more time because we don't have time to, for this, but just I facilitating the way to access the, to this information. You have pol uh, policy briefs, your videos, declaration, and also access to many uh, webinars and other uh, activities. So the three main points of this CAP 2030 initiative is represented in this slide. First, children were not taken into account in all policies. So the idea is to bring children to the center, then to work on the environmental issues. And the third point has to do with how to confront with the harmful commercial marketing to children's and adolescent health. For this purpose, a governance structure has been created that is integrated by the partners in organizations, WHO, UNICEF, and the Lancet. Nine countries that are listed in the slide where Argentina is part of these countries, and a group of working groups where the commercial determinants, uh, commercial marketing is one of them, with many people coming, not only from the commissioners of the report, Lancet report, but also from other places. We have another group working on climate change and another one working on data and uh, learning 
and also knowledge generation. And the secretariat is based in UCL, the University College in London, led by Professor Anthony Costello, a well-known research a professional that was the former director of the maternal and child health program at WHO. So these are the countries involved in this process. So in some way, we represent the different regions of the world. And after one year working, each country define which are the topics and the way each country will approach the main recommendations of the report. For the particular case of Argentina, besides taking into account commercial determinants of child health and the environmental issues, we consider that the governance is a key issue. Consider the high level of fragmentation of the states in terms of duplicating efforts lack of connection, lack of coordination between the different sectors of the government, but also the different levels of the uh, federal state in terms of the lack of relation between the national, the province, and the municipal level. So if there is one way to characterize our scenario, political and institutional, is fragmentation. And we know that in our case, many things can be improved in terms of health, in terms of maximizing resources, in terms of taking more advantage of what we have, uh, 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 starting with a better process of, of governance and better coordination. I particularly don't have the response, but I'm convinced that this is the way. In our case, we will start to work at the municipal level because we don't have the power, we, we don't have the strength, we don't have the resources, but at least at least we can have some places where to start. And this is, uh, this is the idea. After one year working in this activity, we created a sort of networking uh, um, model that is presented in this slide. And you have there an access to a Sprezi communication of our last meeting on January 31st, where each country had the opportunity to explain what was doing during this year of work. So I would say that 2021 was a formative process to engage stakeholders, organizations, UN system, uh, academic organizations, because we consider that we, we cannot work together uh, alone. We need to create uh, links within each country, but also between countries, because we understand that there is a horizontal process of, of, uh, of learning together besides the, different, besides the different levels of development of the, I would say, Northern European countries and those countries that we are in the South. So going to the particular point of the last part of this presentation that has to do with the commercial determinants of child and adolescent world health working group, our goal is to put commercial marketing in the agenda as a key area for improving children's and adolescent health and well-being. And we, as you can imagine, we are dreamers. And we have long-term expectations in terms of changing behavior of governments, in terms of bringing the children and re recognizing the harmful commercial uh, consequences on children across different product areas and ways to regulate these practices, changes also the behavior of marketing industry and businesses just to try to establish codes by ethical codes of marketing beyond profit. So there are people there, in this case, children, that they don't have the power to confront with a, I would say, invasive marketing strategy of the companies. And also to create or to raise the awareness of the impact of harmful marketing on children and more the general public, including awareness of steps needed to reduce its impact. I will answer to you and I want to be honest. We know that we don't have the force, the capabilities, the power, but in some way we have to denounce, we have to create awareness, we have to involve stakeholders. And also I would say there are friendly countries that have strong policies they are in the, in the front line, in the cutting edge, in terms of taking this issue as part of their policies. So we, we think a multi-stakeholder, multi-level, multi-level and uh, multi-country engagement to move this agenda forward. 
these are some of the activities that we have uh, developed during the last year. One was a, a webinar that was called, Are We Selling Children and Adolescent a Lifetime of Ill Health? Considering that there is a huge manufacture and industry uh, and I would say business uh, entrepreneur oriented to promote the consumption of products that are not good for their health. I'm not saying nothing new. And I think that you as US citizens, you have the reality when you go to the streets and this reality of course varies according to the states in the US because the prevalence of a non-communicable disease also varies according to the geographic region, the socioeconomic status, the ethnic and race issues, and also the education. So this is part of a, real, a global reality that we have to confront. All the information of this uh, uh, activity can be accessed through this link. So I have already sent this presentation to the department. So you can access and use all the information that comes in this presentation and more information that you can request afterwards. In this region, the Pan American Health Organization is working with an initiative that is called Windows of Knowledge, Ventanas, Vitrinas do Conocimento in Portuguese, that has to do with how to bring the national, or we say the, the Latin American Library of Health and Medicine based in Brazil, and to bring the commercial determinants as a window of, of knowledge and something that all the countries should be integrated with these six areas of, uh, of knowledge, the commercial determinants, public health regulation, monitoring and evaluation, conflicts of interest, sustainable business, marketing, and commercial interest. So uh, this is something good. What is not good is that the children are not there in these windows of knowledge. And, and part of this effort is to negotiate with PAHO on how to bring children to this particular uh, enterprise. We organize at the end of December, an expert meeting on harmful commercial marketing on children. And as you can see, it was a very, very important consultation, bringing people from different uh, sources, countries, disciplines, professions, backgrounds. Unfortunately, Carlos Santos Burgoa was part of this meeting. Unfortunately, he accepted to participate in this, uh, in this activity. And he could bring, I would say, a multi-perspective scope, considering that he's a Latin American, he lived in Mexico. He had a position at the government. He worked for the Pan American Health Organization. And how he is he in the academia? So I would say he's a unique person uh, that has all this experience and all this capacity in one uh, in one person, and was really challenging to to to, to speak from the inside uh, after leaving, not from from the theoretical. Uh, sources, just by bringing his insights that were really, really helpful. And the purpose of this meeting can be read in, in this slide, was to facilitate this process in order also to start a, a long-term process of, I'm talking about four or five years, on how to move different areas related with advocacy, related with uh, research, related with regulations, uh, related with uh, marketing strategies and involving different sectors. And this is an ongoing process. The Caribbean is also participating and they have launched, launched recently a, a process of bringing the commercial determinants and how to be advocates in this region. So I would say that the flame is growing and the light is also enlightening uh, this region in terms of how to bring these topics in different publics, in different audiences, in different stakeholders. And yesterday, there was a huge meeting on commercial marketing on breast milk substitutes. And when we talk with uh, Carlos, there is an ongoing um, uh, event on breast milk substitutes. He said, again, we are still talking about breast milk substitutes because for many of us that we have experience in public health, we are debating 
on this issue for the last 50 years or more, but still is an issue. Why? Because the, I mean, the, the, the breast milk uh, substitute industry, they need to survive and they're permanently devel developing strategies, marketing strategies in order to eliminate the pressures that different uh, sectors are generating to them. It's not enough. So just to let you know, Carlos, the coming 50 years, this is going to be also a matter for debate. The, mm -hmm. the good news is that there were 7,000 people participating in this meeting. And the, the meeting was the result of a consultation of more than, let's say, 8,000 8, women around the world, focus groups, an, uh, analyzing different sources uh, of information. And you have on the left, the access to the both videos that because there were two events considered in the time zones in the planet. And on the right, you have the report. So you that has been published and launched yesterday. So have you have fresh information. And just I want to let you know this is an ongoing activity and during the year, you will hear more about this. And just to give you a small picture of why marketing is important for us and this is the last part of the presentation. Just let me know if we are okay with the time. And well, just to let you know, marketing is any form of commercial communication that increases the recognition, appeal, or consumption of a product, brand, or, or industry. So if we analyze the theoretical information in the, on many publications, this marketing communication persuades, creates brand loyalty. And this is a function of both exposure, and power. But the question is, what happens when in the middle of these two forces, exposure and power are children? So we will discover that beyond all these forces, there is another issue that comes again, that is the right of a child to decide in freedom. And I will ask you, does a child less than one year or a, an infant can decide in freedom? Or there are some people in the society that we have to assume our role to defend their, their rights in terms of advocate for children. So that's a big issue. And I'm including ourselves as, a, as, as health practitioners, the families, the civil society, the scientific organizations. So rapidly, I will move to the, to the role of these and these different organizations. So we know that in this interrelationship between exposure and power, the movies, the film, they expose people to, to, to tobacco. And there's a high relationship, as you can see in this graph, in terms of exposure and initiation of smoking among adolescents. There is a high relationship between having fun of, of, uh, of the brands because the invasive uh, capacity of the marketing strategy around the world. So I recommend, highly recommend this, this publication that is called Marketing Restriction on how exposed we are to these forces. And also it's about children's rights. So we need a child rights based approach to obesity. We need to promote rights participation of children in digital media. And we know that children are managed because the power of the, of the social media, of the platforms, because they know everything about us, including the children. And in this particular case, the government should see the way to regulate or facilitate a, 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 a healthy use, and I would say a constructive way, use of the technology. So from my personal perspective, we are living in an algorithmic society. So uh, forgive me for this metaphor, but this is a way to just to transmit my my message. In this algorithmic society, we have to decide what do we expect from children? So we expect that children will be objects of marketing, or we expect that children should be subjects of rights. Of course, as you can imagine, my point goes through the second arrow, and children should not be parts of, of marketing, because the, in some way, we're creating a society based on these values. On the left, the neoliberal values that are based on the strength of marketing that moves of our society. And on the right, 
based on true and genuine participation. So on the left, we get social manipulation and on the right, we get genuine participation. So this is something that's easy to present, but very difficult to debate. And I will glad to hear your voices and comment about how to approach this complicated and complex issue. And just to finish also, there are regular regulatory capacities of the government, that this is the case of, as an example of the sugar sweetened beverages, a huge and important issue in Mexico. And something that I want to share is that we don't need to confront with the private sector. I know that we live in a capitalist uh, global uh, uh, situation or mechanism or model. So the idea how to create bridges to regulate in a healthy manner with the private sector. And this is just a, an example how the NHS, the National Health System of uh, of England has proposed the 10 ways that the business can co collaborate to reduce health inequity. So this is a strong presence of the government of the states establishing regulations. And also another thing is that from my point of view, the marketing sector, the business sector, they have the science. And this is just a book to share with you on how to re induce consumer behavior of a life course perspective. So people know how to create fidelity, loyalty from early stages of life. And this is a way to, con to promote consumerism, to promote uh, um, materialistic thinking, to promote the kind of society, very individual, individualistic and based on material goods and not based on the values of the kind of society that we are. And on the right, you can see a, a paper that we have wrote for one of the meetings on how to capture the issues of child development in terms of confront to these marketing companies. But also, and as a foreigner, I want to read what happens in the United States. And again, it's about children's rights. And there are two vignettes, two images that are very strong for me as a foreigner. And um, forgive me if you don't like that this is not politically correct, but this is my contribution to, to the debate. First is something that doesn't happen in the majority of the countries in the planet. So these are the countries where it's constitutional right to keep and bear arms. So United States, Mexico, and Guatemala are the three countries in the, in the world that this is a right. And for us, in the rest of Latin America is something totally difficult to understand as a right. And also, if we see the countries where the Convention of Rights of the Child was not ratified against, we can see the loneliness of the United States compared to the rest of the world in terms of not ratifying the Convention of the Rights against. Children should be objects of marketing or subjects of rights. Are they threatened the children? Why? the US does not ratify this convention. And finally, we can see that the role of civil society. So yeah, society is important to take into account and the conflicts of interest that come from them. This is a recent publication that we have just published on confronting with the journals that they, and the kind of relationship that they have with the manufacturers. The importance of the child rights organizations and the digital market, marketing. And as you could see, in the meeting, expert meeting, the committee of the rights of the child was present. Do you remember that at the very beginning of this presentation, the committee of the rights considered that this is not a big issue. Now they changed their position and they became aware on this important of this issue. And this is part of life. So the, this is part of our everyday challenge in terms of involve people who are reluctant to this issue the importance of this region of Latin America to be aware and to raise this as a, as a key issue in terms of health, the role of research in terms of trying to respond to these uh, questions. And finally, and I promise that I'm going to finish right now, is why this work in Argentina, there are many reasons. I mentioned before the importance of fragmentation, the high levels of poverty that is affecting more than 50% of our children and according the SDGs, there is a need to, uh, to make a transition between the survival model to the, uh, to the quality of life and development. And for this is important 
to update that all the efforts that we made last year were oriented to create a network of institution, just I want to bring here the George Washington University as part of this process. And I want to thank again for your interest to, to participate. And finally, the future plans are oriented to, uh, to, to strengthen all these lines, all these goals working within the, indeed at the country level, but also uh, at the international level with all the participant countries. And something that we also discussed with Carlos, and forgive me, Santos, Carlos, for mentioning to you so many times, this is part of life uh, brings us together. Uh, there is a challenge of how to integrate knowledge generation on how to the, translate into activities and how to make uh, uh, as an implementation, as a policy, as an intervention. Thank you very much and happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I, I bet you, you will have a round of applause uh, now from the audience. Uh, uh, is protecting children against marketing risks a role of public health? I think that is something that for all of us to to, to think about, but not only protecting, but empowering uh, the children to exercise their rights. I think that there is a strong message in this. So it's open for comments and uh, from the audience. Uh, so uh, whoever wants to intervene, we are open for that. So, so Raul, this is Jim. Thanks so much for that. That was a, a compelling presentation. So I want to ask you, um, uh, about frustration and using breast milk substitutes as the, as the model. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned that we've been talking about this and active in this for 40 years now. Um, and you know, basically we, we failed, right? I mean, I, I mean, I think we're doing a better job of promoting breastfeeding than we have in the past. Uh, but I, you know, we, we see one episode after another after another of invasion of commercial marketing to, to poor, especially to poor women uh, after they deliver. Um, that, that happened in a whole variety of different countries. Um, what, you know, so I think we just have to confront the fact that we failed here. Um, and the question is, is why have we failed? Right? How do we how do we adjust strategies and, and and step back and say you know what we've been doing so far hasn't worked in this very compelling model? Right? This is not a this is, there's no argument here, right? Um, uh, you know, so what 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 can we do to try to address the a, a to acknowledge our fa failure in this arena and then to kind of pivot uh, in a way that actually be, will be more effective. Well, uh, I don't want to turn this conversation into a psychotherapy uh, meeting, but I, I will talk from my deep thoughts. Uh, I agree with you, Jane. Uh, there is a huge level of frustration, but part of our, way, our challenge as public health practitioner is how to overcome frustration. Uh, then to ask ourselves, so let's reanalyze what happened in all this last year, uh, last 50 years. I know that if nothing would happen, the situation would be worse. So I, I wouldn't be so, uh, so uh, pragmatic in terms of saying that nothing happened. Because if we remember, there was a first uh, trial against the breast, the breast milk substitute manufacturer. There was a book that has been uh, titled uh, uh, the baby killer, the, la, the multinational companies of manufacture against the babies. So as a result of this uh, trial, the researchers that made this trial, they failed, they lost. So I assume they were frustrated. But as a result of the, that, WHO implemented the International Code of Marketing of Breast Meat Substitutes. So at least we could get something. And again, we have to reread all the evidence, the history and all what happened. And from my personal point of view, is that we fail in terms of choosing the best strategy to confront with that forces. 
Sometimes we from the academia and from the governments were extremely naive in considering that with a good brochure, a good, with a good video, we're gonna change the minds of the people and the mothers and the families of poor countries. And I'm totally convinced that the brochure doesn't make a revolution. So we have to go to the upper levels of power in terms of regulation, something that Carlos is strengthening permanently because he has, uh, I assume that he has also some level as a human being, some level of frustration. But we have to learn about this and just to share with this coming generation, all the students that are here, that we have to rethink this, bringing the power of communication, the power of uh, social media, the power of reaching the, those are, are, that are unreachable to bring champions. So, uh, I, I mean, I have no specific answer, but we have to learn from the last years and just to, to rethink other strategies for the coming future. Uh, Emily and Adam, uh, we have seven minutes, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and very important work. I wonder if you could say a bit more uh, how you think about these things in the context of food systems. So I don't study food systems, but my colleagues who do definitely will talk about really one of the problems in sub-Saharan Africa is the lack of involvement in, in private sector in some of these major uh, food multinationals really not participating in the market. So a lot of countries wanting to do things to encourage these companies to come into the market in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, to kind of improve some of the food system. So I wonder uh, how you think about that and maybe if there are any opportunities um, as this is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa to both improve, improve market uh, participation, but also, I don't know, improve regulation as that's happening. Uh, as you could see, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. We have other two uh, uh, people from Adam and Jack Sandwerk. So maybe we can hear uh, the three questions, uh, given that we have only uh, six minutes, and then you can uh, respond to, to all of them, if you agree. Adam, please. <laughs> okay, tall, tall order, I'll, I'll try to be brief. So uh, again, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Um, one thing that, with the commercial determinants of health that uh, I, I asked, colleagues you know, involved is how it's distinguished from corporate determinants um, of health. And uh, in the CAP report in the, in the Lancet, you know, mentions child labor and human trafficking. So examples of slightly more direct, right, adverse health consequences for children. Uh, I'm going to assume, right, that, the, that there's value, right, in really focusing the commercial determinants of health on marketing and messaging to inform parents, children, and community about the manipulative messages that are actively being disseminated by corporations. But what's the role then to inform them about what corporations sort of aren't telling you about the products, like the fact that it was made by child labor, right? Or that they trafficked the kids there, right? And so how can, you know, what 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 is that the, the role for, um, how does that fit into the commercial determinants of health? Thanks. Okay, let's move on quickly, Jack and, and Nino, and then uh, Raul, and, and we, we stop the, the questions. Jack, please. You know, real quickly, mine's a little different from everybody else's. My question is this, I mean, so you're, you're not drawing a fine distinction in this talk of products <clears throat> which are being marketed to children and products which are being marketed which are harmful to children. Breast milk is, of course, you know, potentially one of the examples, smoking, et cetera, et cetera. So if, you know, if your goal is to regulate marketing, where do you draw the line between the, you know, in loco parenthesis of the state uh, in controlling what children are exposed to, to extending that to what adults are exposed to, which is also an issue of rights in, in some way? That's my question. Thank you, Jack and Nino. Hi, everyone. Hi, Raul. Uh, very nice presentation. I'm so glad to, to um, listen to it. Extremely um, well done and congratulations on this fantastic work. I've been doing work in the field of commercial determinants of health for past three years now. So I'm very delighted to see more members of our 
uh, community to be involved in this. So congratulations. And then I just I just want to make just small comment and just maybe answer slightly uh, Adam's question. Corporate co uh, corporate determinants will fall under commercial determinants because commercial determinants do cover much broader broader categories of uh, determinants. Uh, but in terms of my comment would be that while um, Raul, uh, Raul's presentation was specifically on marketing, market in, marketing is just one of the myriad of the strategies and tactics that corporations are using. So um, from my perspective, what matters is just to address commercial determinants broadly, um, rather than just focus only on marketing. Because if you just work on the marketing, they're using many other tactics, such as lobbying, such as financial tactics, legal tactics, uh, changing products, as you said, corporate determinants. So I think for us, as, as I see public health community, I think we need to be more aware and understanding that marketing is just one little, little uh, strategy that they're using. And they have this whole arsenal of other tactics that are, that are constantly deploying, including uh, making influence on UN organizations and UN is the major organization that is the least, how to say, corrupt by these uh, big corporations because on decision tables, UN constantly accepts these multinational corporations to be there, including breast milk uh, corporation representatives, Coke, whether that's gonna be alcohol, any other. So unless those organizations and decision makers are free of the influence, I think it's gonna be very hard to address them. Thank you. We have a challenge, uh, Raul, so jump in. Well, thank you, Nina, for your comments. And uh, just to let you know, I don't have answers to all of your requests. Perhaps some of them we need to rethink together on how to bring different alternatives. So go, going first to Emily's question regarding food system and regulation, you could see one of the slides with a list of, uh, just a short list of countries where they decided to establish regulations towards the food industry. And the question is why, what happened there? And when you see that kind of a protagonistic role of the governments, you will see that at the governmental level, at the decision making level, there are people. So something happened in the policy making people that they consider that this is a big issue. And uh, this is what, what happened, for instance, in Mexico and it happened also in, in Chile, where, the, where there was a decision to bring this and to raise this. This was much easier in Chile compared to Argentina, where just we, the last year we launched a law of, of labeling, but the, was, the power of the food industry was so, so strong that this, for some or another reason, this law couldn't be passed. And for Argentina, the production of, of, uh, of food is a very important source of money. So you will see this tension, not only with the food industry, it also happened with, uh, with tobacco. Argentina was, is presenting in, in many universities around the world as a case study where the corporation has much power than the president of the, of the state. And this happened in the 90s where they launched the, the law against tobacco and the, the tobacco agreement you, with WHO couldn't be launched or couldn't be passed because the, the power. So the point is how to create awareness and power among the policy, uh, policy makers and to raise this as an important issue. So this is a building process that involves all the society is not restricted to one person or to a, a specific sector. Uh, going to uh, Adam's comment, I think that in some way regarding uh, uh, the, the difference between uh, corporate and, and uh, commercial determinants, in some way, uh, Nino has already clarified this big issue. But besides that, Adam, what I can tell you is, is there are many, uh, com I would say, words or definitions that are not already established. So we are in a sort of building process of a glossary that considers this dimension, but apply to the, uh, to the child world. 
So we, we are learning together. I'm not an expert, expert in corporations, but we think that we have to take all these dimensions into to account. And also related with the issue of child labor and child trafficking. This was an issue also with, and also with sexual commercial, sexual abuse of children and uh, sexual involvement of children in sexual uh, uh, activities. And this is also a business. And this was a debate in, for us in terms of how to establish limits or borders of which topic should be included and which not, because we know there are some uh, uh, United Nations organizations that do, they are working the particular issues. So again, to establish a line that is something that has been uh, uh, raised by, it, by Jack on how to draw a line, is very, we know that when we draw a line is something artificial, and, but for strategic uh, reasons, we decided to consider these issues, recognizing that the, the problems that you are mentioning, they're also related, but we cannot approach all of them based on the, the reasons that I explained before. And the, uh, finally, uh, Again, to, to draw to the, the issue of drawing a line, uh, I also in some way explain on that sometimes this line varies according to the age of the child. Sometimes the, the marketing strategy, they approach the child directly, but sometimes through an intermediate person like the, the family. I mean, the child does not get any information on the breast milk substitutes, but the mother from, since pregnancy, she is bombarded by these companies in terms of getting the information. And uh, I will have, well, uh, in the slide you will share, you will see a slide, a, a video, short video that has been presented yesterday on the power of these companies. And perhaps it will also help uh, Jim to answer he, his question. And there's one magic word that has been raised yesterday by a, a representative of Mexico that this has mentioned by Nino, and the word is corruption. Corruption is there and is difficult to understand all this process in a transparent world. And we will see that all the mechanisms of using corruption to corrupt the policymakers, to bribery, to, to do, I would say, dirty lobbying activities, they are still there. While we are uh, talking to each other, looking our faces, watching our eyes. There are people that are trying to uh, to to include their agenda within uh, at the governmental level and to promote the, the products that sometimes are not healthy for the people. Over. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we are past uh, one one o'clock. I. I I think that it was a very stimulating uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Raul, and thank you for all of you. Uh, we have half the audience that remained after, after 1 p.m., so they are excited uh, to be here. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for being here. And uh, Nino and, and Raul, we should move to our next meeting. OK? Thank you Do very we stay much. He Do we stay here? or? Oh, I send you another link. OK. OK? Bye-bye, and thank you so much. Okay, Have a good bye. Day.